Hi, and welcome to The Week Ahead. I'm Tony Nash. I'm joined by Albert Marco, Sam Rines, and Tracy Shukart. Thanks for joining us. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to ask you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I uh, also want to let you know about CI Futures, our subscription product. We cover thousands of assets and economic concepts on CI Futures. Our forecasts are refreshed every weekend. You come in Monday morning and have a brand new forecast each week. Um, right now, we're offering a special subscription price of $50 a month. Please go to completeintel.com slash promo and uh, find out more. So this week, we had a few key themes. First is the inverted yield curb, curve and Fed policy. Second is the SPR release and crude market. And the third is around tech. Is there a comeback in tech? Sam, you're up first. Let's talk about the yield curve. It's on everyone's mind, um, and it only seems to be intensifying. Um, it's happened four times over the last 22 years. So, uh, Albert and Sam, can you help us understand what does it mean? Uh, how does it impact Fed policy? Are they going to be more cautious going forward? Um, and how will it import markets more broadly? Well, Tony, um, concerning the inverting the yield curve, uh, you know, Jerome Powell doesn't really want to do that. However, Janet Yellen does want to invert the yield curve. You know, this is the divide that's been throwing off the market analysts for quite a long time, quite a, quite a while now, and actually myself. And I just realized what, the, you know, just found out and realized where the divide was. And, um, you know, normally in a, in a deep quad four to take something, you know, from Edge Eyes commentary, um, the only things that you can buy, you know, are treasuries and gold. And right now it's just, you know, Powell will be fighting a tide because of, because of the long dated treasures is the number one thing to own in that scenario. So you know, you know, trying to protect stocks while hurting housing, and then you have Yellen that's trying to protect housing. You know, it's quite a mess, and it's probably something like Sam can actually detail. You know, the inverted yield curve on. So why are there the two camps? Just to go into that down that trail for a second. Well, it's just it's a it's a policy. You know, you know, yeah, it's a policy. Uh, it's ideology, basically, and like okay. what they're. You know, Yellen did this before in 2013, 2014, I believe, okay. and you know Powell is not really an economist; he's a lawyer, so he's probably hearing it from his, you know, from his little circle of miscreants. So that's that's <laughs> you know that's where that's where that's coming from. You know, I think fine Yellen, people. That, yeah, whoever's I mean, listening, I'm sure they're fine people. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure they are. Um, I think you know Yellen is probably correct in this instance, but we'll see how that plays out. Okay. Sam, what do you think? Yeah, in, you know, inverted yield curve generally, you know, everybody's like, hey, recession on the horizon. In, in reality, um, yeah, I mean, there's always a recession at some point on the horizon. And what the yield curve tells you is that there's one coming in the future. No, right. no kidding. Uh, but it's not good for one timing, it, a recession, period. I mean, right. it could, so we've got you know, a, the twos and tens spread on the screen right now. So can you tell us, you know, what does that mean and how much importance does that hold with that two, two and 10 uh, yield spread going negative? I mean, it's, it's something to pay attention to. I mean, it's the okay. market, you know, the market is telling you something with that. You know, there is, a, there is some signal, even if, it, even if there's noise in there as well, that the Fed is going to go very, very quickly and is likely to break housing or break something else or break housing and something else. And that that's going to um, probably cause inflation to come back down, right? The market does not believe that, or at least the fixed income market does not believe that inflation is going to be a problem in 10 years, does not believe that the Fed is going to be able to hold interest rates very high for very long. And that's why you get the two tens inverted, right? The Fed is going so to go above what, you know, the quote unquote natural rate or the stall rate is for the U.S. economy. Right. So we've been saying for several weeks, you know, the demand destruction is the only way that the Fed's going to solve supply side inflation. Uh, and the last couple of weeks, you've talked about the Fed breaking something. At this point, the Fed almost has to break something, right? I mean, Volcker broke something in the early 80s, right? That, that something has to be broken. Yes. I mean, something has to be broken or you're not going to solve the inflation issue. And you have to do it in a pretty, you know, you have to do it in a pretty rapid manner of tightening in order to uh, get the inflation levels that we have now back to something somewhat reasonable in a time frame that is adequate. Uh, but again, it, it doesn't tell you what you know. Doesn't tell you what's going to break. I mean, you know, we okay. talked about it last week. Housing looks sick. 
Yeah. Um, housing equities look sick. Uh, it, you know, it does not look great. Um, but it doesn't tell you much about the broader market, right? Okay. It's, it's a lot of noise. Two tens, you know, you can say that it's bad for equities, but generally it takes a while for it to be bad for equities. Okay, generally. great. Now, JP Morgan put out a note this week. Everyone's putting out notes about when rates are going to rise. They said 50 in May, 50 in June. Is that still, are you thinking that? Or, or is that kind of on the edge of aggressive? I, I, I mean, it's aggressive, but the Fed has very little choice but to be aggressive in this instance, or it's going to lose credibility further, uh, and that's an issue for it, right? It doesn't want to lose that, that call it that little bit of credibility it has left um, to, you know, raising rates too slowly in an environment where it's getting the green light to do so uh, from markets, right? Markets have it priced in, why not do it? Yeah, if someone said in January that we'd be ra raising 50 in May and 50 in June, I think you'd be laughed at. But now it's it's taken seriously. So it, it's just really interesting to see the iteration of Fed expectations. Okay, speaking of inflation, let's move on to energy prices. Tracy, obviously, there's still a big problem. And this week, the Biden administration announced a very large release from the Strate Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, you've been all over this, uh, including the tweet you sent out on Thursday, which is on our screen, uh, talking about logistical issues. So the main question, I think, for most people is, will this bring down oil prices uh, on a sustainable basis? So can you talk to us about that and some of the unintended con consequences of the SBR release? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it's not enough to uh, keep this like keep oil prices sustainably lower, right? It doesn't fix the structural supply deficit that we have years to come. Also, this kind of, this slows shale growth because it disincentivizes shale producers from drilling more, which actually needs to be done. Um, and also creates potential logistical bottlenecks because we've never released this much before. Mm -hmm. um, that could cause congestion on the Gulf Coast, and that tweet is up, I think, um, talking about yeah, the bottlenecks there. Yep. Um, and then there's another issue that um, has not been discussed yet broadly. And that's because um, the, the SPR is aging, right? And so we've had releases before where we've seen degradation in oil. Mm. And uh, we've also, um, in 2015, they approved a $2 billion uh, upgrade to the SPR, which is not going to be done till 2025. That said, what they did is um, they did everything except for the distribution centers. So what will happen is we need to see if we can actually get a million barrels per day pushed, pushed through. So there's a lot of obstacles here. Mm. So it's a sentimental kind of downside for oil right now. Nothing's really released yet. And it doesn't seem all that feasible that it'll come out soon, right? So right. supply chain issues like we're seeing everywhere else. So we had a viewer question from uh, at Vandana Hari SG. It says, to what extent will Biden's threat to U.S. drillers um, to drill or get off the lease produce desired results? Will we see, you mentioned frackers earlier, uh, will we see much movement there? No, I mean, I think, you know, Biden did call um, for Congress to make this decision. Um, Personally, I do not believe that this will actually get passed by Congress. Um, that said, again, this disincentivizes oil companies from producing more because it's not that easy to just turn on wells. They're facing labor shortages. They're facing supply chain shortages. It's not that easy to do that. So if you tell them we're gonna tax you on this, then if they abandon those wells, then it's going to take that much longer to get them back online when they are ready to. So it, all in all, it's a horrible idea. Again, I do not see Congress passing this whatsoever. So it's complicated. And I think that's the thing that we're, you know, we live in a world that likes to simplify things a lot, right? And we like to say, we're going to do X, we're going to do Y, we're going to do Z. And it, it, the implementation of this stuff seems to be a lot more complicated than, than we hear from, say, these non-experts that, that talk to us all day long on TV or social media. Well, yeah. exactly. I mean, right. 
We can't just wave a wand to uh, fix supply and, chain. And turn on oil wells. I mean, right. regardless, we have run through our duck supply, right? And that's why we're seeing slower oil production. The monthly EIA monthly just came out yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, it was 11.37 million barrels instead of 11.6 million that they were estimating um, in the weeklies. And so um, what happens is, is that you're pulling down duck wells, which are the ones that you can get up easily and then you're putting all these restraints on oil companies and threatening them with taxes and, and things of that nature and so you know to get a well online from start to finish is you know, six to 12 months people right. don't realize it's not let's snap our fingers and tomorrow we're spurting oil it's not exactly a nudge right remember under the obama administration they really focused on Kahneman and the nudge and all that stuff this is kind of the opposite of that. It's like the bludgeon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> bludgeon these exactly. guys you know, doing what they want, right? So, exactly. okay, let's this move is, on to equities. A, Sorry, go ahead. No, nah, this is just political rhetoric. I mean, they're better off just jumping into the oil futures market and trying to drive it down. There's, this is just this is just talk, you know, by the Biden administration. There's really no substance to it. Do you it's think like they can? Can they jump into the futures market and, and short it and drive the price down? Yeah, who, who says they haven't? Okay. You know, I mean, they're, you're talking, you're looking at... Uh, 127 price and all of a sudden it's down in the 90s i mean when, yeah. what, what what is this crypto crude uh what what are we what are we doing here you that's know good, okay so, that's a good point Albert. All and, right. and just just one last point to that and you know i know tracy i actually think tracy tweeted this out a couple of weeks ago the latest dallas fed survey of oil companies made it pretty clear that a lot of them at no they don't care what where the price is they're not increasing their output um, they put that yeah. on paper and put that in the survey. Uh, I, I think that's worth remembering is that this is a less price sensitive reaction than people are going to give credit for. 100%. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, great, guys. That's fantastic. Okay, let's move on to equities. Um, Albert, uh, we've seen tech stocks um, rally pretty hard for the last couple of weeks since about March 14th. Um, we've got charts for Alphabet and Facebook on the screen right, screen right now, sorry, Meta on the screen right now. <laughs> What's happening uh, to tech? What's happened over the last couple of weeks and how long do you expect them to rally? Well, they've, they've used tech, maybe a dozen names to rally the market. This isn't well known. I mean, if right. you look at those names that you have listed along with, you know, like AMD and NVIDIA and Adobe, you know, they can be up to 30, 40% of the call action on a given day. It's, mm. You know, it's kind of silly, but honestly, it's like we're, this is a zero rate, you know, economy at the moment. So as our yeah. rates go, up, yeah. yeah. So, you know, as, as our rates go up, you know, I, I don't see how tech is going to going to rally much further. OK, so I'll just, go ahead. So I'll just throw in that uh, just because BAMO came out with their weekly flows um, that we've had tech market was three point one billion dollars, which is the highest in two months. OK, interesting. All right, so, so if we go with the uh, note that came out that in May and June, we'll see 50 basis point rises, and you're saying tech can't continue to rally into higher interest rates. Or are you saying, you know, we're looking at that type of horizon for tech to not be as attractive? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see how, I, don't, I just, you know, <laughs> unless they reverse course come June or July, I don't see how tech can really rally to what their all-time highs were a couple okay. months. I don't see it. Sam, does that make sense to you? Uh, it does make sense to me. I think the only saving grace for tech thus far has been that the long end of the curve hasn't react, it hasn't done much, and you know it actually looks a little sick at the moment in terms of yield, and and that's been a little bit of a call it a semi tailwind at least profit okay. month. Great. Okay, perfect. Um, let's look at the week ahead. Um, some things we have for the week ahead are rubles for oil and gas. Uh, when will Europe give in? Uh, housing stocks in the housing market. Sam mentioned that earlier. We'll dive a little deeper into that. And then the mixed messages around simultaneous stimulus and tightening, uh, which I think is confusing some people. So first, let's, let's dive into ru rubles for oil and gas. I did a quick Twitter survey earlier, which is up on your screen. Um, asking people how long before Europe caves and pays for oil and gas in rubles, something like 70% of people think they'll do that within two weeks. Um, it's just a Twitter survey. Some of those guys are experts, some of those aren't. 
Tracy, what do you think? Is that realistic? Well, they actually came out. I mean, Putin actually came out today and said, um, this is the plan. There is no backing out. However, it doesn't include what you've pretty much already bought. That means so deliveries until uh, most delivery are uh, until April 15th. And then really in March 1st is where that really starts, where Europe will really have to start paying in rubles. So right? May 1st is when you think the real May 1st is the May 1st is really when the bulk of this situation will come in hand because it's not for what has already been ordered, right? Okay. So does that, so does that make sense? You think we could see a trickle in mid-April? So I think, it, yeah, exactly. And that, but I think that they're going to have to do that. They really have no other choice unless they kind of want to plunge into the dark ages, right? There's just not, the backup plan is forming, but it's just not there yet. So I think so, that they will concede, um, even though they have a little like, bit of a time, you know, they have, you know, 15 to 30 days to really, um, but you can't move that fast. I mean, you can't, it's not that easy to change suppliers that quickly. Right, we've talked about this a little bit, but what happens to say industrial output? Uh, German manufacturing, if they decide not to do this. I mean, to be honest, sounds like a pretty trivial thing to me to pay in another currency. I mean, there is there is a transaction cost to it, but if you've got a major economy, it doesn't sound like a you know something that you can really stand by insisting to pay in dollars. So, what no. happens to German manufacturing? What happens to industrial it will manufacturing plummet. cost Europe? It'll actually plummet. I mean, BASF already came out and said. We're going to have to cut production if this happens. The German plan is basically to shut down manufacturing and to give residential um, the leeway in, you know, if they have to start rationing. So that means if manufacturing shuts, starts shutting down in Europe, you're in recession territory immediately. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah, Tony. They'll find they'll find a way. I mean, they'll have they'll find some special exactly. special vehicle to sort this out. They got a little bit of time, like Tracy said. They got about two months really to sort this out. And anyways, like na the weather's starting to get warmer, so the less gas will be used anyways. So it's I, I don't I don't see this to be really of a big problem. It's just a lot of noise and a little bit of leverage from Russia, you know, on the sanctions that are they're getting hit by. So. Well, but, you know, conceivably the, you know, because of the embargoes on some of the banks in Russia, it could be a, a real issue with um, having funds in rubles in Russian banks. No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, they can, they can use, they can go use, go between in the Swiss, uh, London will do it. I mean, it's the same thing as the one, the remember it's like, you know, when they trade it, you know, for oil, the Saudis, you know, sell it in uh, Remimbi and goes to London, gets converted instantly and it's dollars, you know, almost immediately to the seller. So it's not, I don't think it's going to be a problem. I 100% agree that the currency doesn't really matter because it's still factored into what is the dollar value, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. really matter. Right. Or, you know, in, in EU, in Europe's case, what is, e, e, you know, Euro, e yeah. Euro, Euro per uh, megawatt hour. So, right. um, Regardless, it's not really the currency that matters so much. Right. The fact is the currency is helping. What Russia is trying to do is that if you have to sell euros to buy rubles, that keeps the currency afloat. Right, right. which we've seen it surge back this week right. to pre-war levels. So, okay, great. Let's move on to um, homes and home builders. Uh, uh, Sam, you mentioned the housing market and housing stocks earlier. And we've got on the um, on the screen a chart about uh, U.S. real estate uh, and home builders and the divergence between those, and they're usually pretty correlated. Uh, can you talk us through your expectations for real estate relative to where home builders are trading right now? Oh, uh, they'll they'll be they'll look like uh, home builders pretty quickly here. Uh, it's it's what the Fed is basically able to do in terms of the economy quickly, right? If you're going to tighten rates by two, you know, two and a half percent in a year plus quantitative tightening, that, that's what you're going to hit. You're going to hit home builders and real estate. Uh, that's okay. generally what you're going to hit, and you're going to hit it fast. Um, uh, in, in particular, the shorter duration type uh, real estate that's benefited the most from uh, zero rates. Uh, if the long end of the curve stays, you know, somewhat subdued, you know, you're probably you're probably fine if you have longer duration type retail, retail or uh, 
that type of lease, but the shorter term uh, duration real estate type plays are going to be in some trouble here. Okay. Um, and so you say it's going to happen pretty quickly. Last week, you said it's going to happen in Q2. Um, mm -hmm. When I first heard that, I was a little bit surprised, but just seeing what's happened over the past week, it's been really surprising to me that that things have moved so quickly. So um, I think I think you're right. I'm, I'm it really interested to see that that happen. Now, you also mentioned QT. So so let's um, guys talk a little bit about kind of the tightening and easing, the simultaneous tightening and easing that we have going on. And how do we expect that to move over the next week? So Sam, you've been pretty insistent that QT is going to start in May. Is that right? Oh, yes. Yes. There's okay. Little so doubt. definitely going to start in May. Now, we've got countries and states giving energy stimulus and other things happening. I wouldn't be surprised if different forms of stimulus come out. So <clears throat> how does it work where we have really fairly significant stimulus coming out as we're tightening? What, is, what do people read from that? I, I would say confusion. Right. If you're trying to yeah. actually tackle, if you're trying to tackle inflation with monetary policy, uh, you know, you, that really has to break something in order to get it under control. And yet you're giving people more leeway to, you know, not have something break, right? More money in their pockets. Uh, it's counterproductive, right? So you begin to either have to tighten more and, or tighten quicker or both. Um, to get it under control, or you have to stop it with the fanciful fiscal. What are you hearing about that, Albert, um, out of D.C.? You know, I was on this program, when was it, about a year ago, talking about tapering with uh, Andreas, mm -hmm. and I was I was against tapering. I, I didn't, ever, didn't think it was going to happen, but because the fact is that we just keep going on with QE. Like, how, mm -hmm. do, you, how do you tighten when you have QE and the a Fed balance sheet still expanding by $100 billion plus a week? I mean, that's not, uh, you know, this is why there's so much confusion in the market. Like Sam was saying, it's just... You know, you talk about tightening. Meanwhile, you secretly, you know, spend $160 billion to uh, pump the market. So w w which one is it? You know, and w how, as an analyst, how do you even assess what you're going to do over the next 30 days when, you know, the Fed's confused, the Fed versus Treasury is confused. So, so can we have that where we're, say, doing tightening, but helping equity markets continue to rise? I mean, is that just weird? Of course, it's it is weird. You can't have monetary policy going head to head with fiscal policy, right? So you're having <laughs> fiscal policy loosening. At least let's look at the, the energy markets right now. Um, you know, you can't have all of this stimulus. And it's not just from the United States. It's from uh, across the world is doing this. And we're going to see more of this uh, every week of new countries come out and say not in Japan. Energy. Japan is easing across the board. Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> everyone else. <laughs> true, true, true. <clears throat> um, but, you know, of course, you know, I agree completely with Sam said it's confusion in the markets because you are literally having central banks butting heads with governments right now. Yep. Yeah. And that's something that's something that people don't really pay attention to. It's not simply the U.S. Federal Reserve with the U.S. economy, but it's it's the Federal Reserve with all of Anglosphere. You right. know, they can have, they can have the Canadians or the U.K., do tightening while we do expansion and vice versa. And they can do it unendingly. It's unbelievable. So when do we know the direction that, you know, when do we know whether we're tightening or easing? Do, do we come to a point like is May the end point for easing? I, I don't know, Tony. I, I can't I can't really tell you that because, you know, they can say that they're doing that. And then we find out, you know, two months later that they didn't do it. Okay. You know, and they can use all sorts of weird little gimmicks that they have control over. Okay. Sam, what do you think? Uh, I, I think that the comment about the Anglosphere is really, was really interesting because it's 100% true, right? If you look at uh, a lot of the EMs, they've been tightening for a year or, you know, at least nine right. months. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that that's the, that's the really intriguing uh, com kind of comment uh, for me is you know, the, the U.S. is probably so late to the game that EM is going to be easing by the time the Fed mm. actually accomplishes any sort of tightening. <laughs> They'll have to. They will uh -huh. have to. Yeah, <laughs> which, which sets something interesting up, by the way. Sorry? Which sets something interesting up for when that happens, but that's down the road. It really does, yeah. 
Um, remember the synchronized easing and synchronized tightening a decade ago? I just feel, you know, <laughs> we're just, we, we have so many mixed messages out there that uh, it's no wonder we have the volatility that we have in mind. Mm-hmm. So, yep. all right, guys. Hey, thanks very much for this. Uh, really appreciate it. Have a great week ahead. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.